Now, hello everybody and welcome to our chemistry magic show here in University College Cork. Now, I would like to begin by asking Dennis Duggan to do a little experiment for us. Before Dennis came to us here in UCC, he worked for a spy in the CIA and he was always sending me secret messages. And he's an extraordinary character. So Dennis, could you produce for us here a little secret message for us? And as you can see, out of nowhere, it appears as if the writing is coming there by magic. Now, everything tonight is based on scientific facts. There is no sort of mumbo jumbo Harry Potter stuff. And we'll be explaining the chemistry as we go along. Many of you here are a bit too young yet to have started your study of chemistry. But when you go into secondary school, you will be studying science, and that's one third of which is chemistry. And those of you who have completed your junior certificate science program have the opportunity to do chemistry for your leaving certificate. And that is one of the purposes of this magic show to show you that chemistry is an interesting and a very fun subject. So we're going to start off with a little experiment. And this experiment is designed to test your powers of observation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some water out of the container here. And I'm going to put that water into one of the coffee cups. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how good are your powers of observation to see if you can figure out the cup. Oh, look what's up in the ceiling there. Look what's up in the ceiling to see if you can figure out where the water is. So we have a vote. How many people in the audience think that this is where the water is? One, two, three. How many people here think water's in this one? Only two. How many people think the water's in this one? One, two, three. And how many people think the water's in this one? One, two, three, 227. <laughs> right. So 227 of us here in the audience tonight think the water is in this cup. But of course, when I turn the cup <laughs> upside down, the water has disappeared. And where has the water gone to? Well, there's an old saying, the quickness of the hand deceives the eye. So while all of you were looking at the cups, I got the water back into the jug. Now, <clears throat> now the question is, is it magic? No. Is it chemistry? Yes. Because I performed that experiment by using a chemical. And the chemical I used has a big complicated name. It's called sodium polyacrylate. But you'll understand what I mean if I tell you it's a chemical that's used in babies' nappies because this chemical absorbs 100 times its own weight in water. So before ye came in, I put a spoon of the sodium polyacrylate into the coffee cup. And those of you, 227 of you, who picked this were absolutely right. And if you were to look into the coffee cup now, I know the lecture theatre is very big, you can't see it, but if you were to look into the coffee cup, what you would see is a lump of jelly. The water that I added literally just disappeared into the jelly. So sodium polyacrylate is a very useful material for absorbing water. Now, how then did I manage to get the water back into this jug. This jug is a very interesting one. One of the advantages of being a chemistry teacher is that you go to chemistry conferences. 
And I went to a conference in Indianapolis a number of years ago. And I saw this trick being done by a chemistry teacher who was also an amateur magician. And sometimes when he'd pour it out, hardly any water would come out of it. And then people would say, oh, the jug is now empty. But then he'd fool us by having loads of water coming out of it. And people wonder, what's going on here? So sometimes our eyes can deceive us. You think I'm pouring water into the jug there. And when I try to pour more, but then more of you have faith and you know, oh, there's certainly water inside in that jug. And when I pour it out, sure enough. So this is real magic. And those of you who want to know how this jug works, you can come up to me after the show and I'll explain how it is that this jug seems to give water over and over again, limitlessly. Now, powers of observation. <clears throat> I want you to look at this carefully. Now, we see there that the yellow one is smaller than the red one. Would we agree with that? Okay. Now, watch this. So the yellow one is the smaller one. So if I put these behind my back and bring them out, okay, now the yellow one is the bigger one. How am I doing that trick? How do you think I'm doing it? You think this has one color and the other has another color. Okay, that, that's a good hunch or a hypothesis is what big word we use. Very good suggestion. How many people would agree with that suggestion? Quite a few of us. But you have to be careful that sometimes when I turn it around, there's nothing at all. Okay? So there, the red seems to be the smaller one. And there, the red seems to be the bigger one. And that's why we need science. And physics is often described as the science of measurement because our eyes can deceive us. So there the yellow seems smaller. There the yellow seems bigger. Okay, there's the yellow smaller. There's the yellow bigger. In fact, they're both exactly the same size. What deceives our eye is that the length of that arc is longer than the length of that arc. So when I have it like that, it appears as if it's smaller. And when I have it like that, it appears to be bigger. So we'll carry on anyway to our next experiment. Now, uh, you saw at the beginning of the chemistry magic show that Donica here exploded some balloons. I wonder what was in the balloons? Hydrogen gas. Would it be? How many people would think it's helium? quite a few of us. Well now, if you went down to the store and bought a helium balloon and then brought it home and lit it and blew your granny out the window, would that be a very good idea? No. no. So you're right, it's not helium. Very often people, there's helium in balloons. The element that's in the balloon there is hydrogen. Now, that element there is the first element in the periodic table, and it's called hydrogen. It's a very light element. You might see how high the balloons floated, but it's also an explosive element. And there was a big airship that was landing in Chicago way back in 1937, and there was a lightning storm, and it exploded. So it was a terrible accident. So with hydrogen gas, you have to be very careful indeed uh, with it. The next thing I want to teach you about is the air, or often called the atmosphere around us. And what we're going to do now is, as you may be aware from school, the atmosphere extends about 10 kilometers above the Earth. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some of the gases that are in the atmosphere. And the first gas that we're going to look at is carbon dioxide, which is only present in small amounts. Now, there's a fire extinguisher around there somewhere. There is. Now, uh, 
the, the place that you may see carbon dioxide quite commonly is in an ordinary fire extinguisher. A carbon dioxide fire extinguisher <laughs> is wonderful because carbon dioxide has great properties and everybody should at some stage set off a fire extinguisher because you need to be trained. If the first time you ever set off a fire extinguisher is when there's a real fire, you might know what to do. Now, carbon dioxide has some great properties. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some of the carbon dioxide that's in the fire extinguisher there. Now, I'm putting on these gloves to protect my hand because the substance that I form is actually a very cold substance. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to put on my safety glasses to give good example. And what we're going to do now is we are going to put a little cloth like this over the mouth of the fire extinguisher. And we'll just see what happens when I release the gas. No. When I open that, when I open that, you'll see inside, in the cloth, we have this white substance. Now, inside, in the fire extinguisher, you have all these little particles of carbon dioxide running around inside. And when you release them, they try to escape through the cloth, but many of them get caught and they're turned from a, liquid, from a gas into a solid. Now, what do you notice about that solid little boy? Stick your finger in it. Just touch it. What's it? What do you notice? It's very, cold. very cold. What do you notice about it? Very cold also. That substance there is called dry ice. It's a common name for solid carbon dioxide. And before they invented refrigerated vans, this was added to your ice cream in blocks in order to keep the ice cream cold. The temperature of that is minus 60 degrees centigrade. That's colder even than the North Pole. Now, Donica and Dennis, have we got some solid carbon dioxide there, please? Grant. Now, Donica and Dennis today made lumps of solid carbon dioxide for me, just like this big slabs of it. And if I could have some boiling water, please, in a beaker. If we take some solid carbon dioxide, thanks, Sudaman, you might give me some water there. Now, watch what happens. Thanks, Sudaman, that's perfect. Watch what happens if I put some of the dry ice into this. We straight away notice this cloud that's formed. This is often used in the horror films. You're in Frankenstein's laboratory and everything is bubbling away in the background and it's real scary, <laughs> sort of thing. But, but he's not scared at all, he's only laughing at me. Now, the cloud that you see there is exactly the same as the cloud you see in the sky, exactly. All that we're doing is we're using the very cold carbon dioxide to cool the air. And that's why I asked Suderman to give me hot water, because I knew there'd be lots of water vapour up there. So carbon dioxide is a very useful substance. If I ask David to take a bit of dry ice, and he's going to put it into the, the uh, glove there. Now, just look at what happens when he puts it into the glove. Now, he's sealing the glove and he's trapping the carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is one of the few substances which goes directly from a solid into a gas. That's why it's called dry ice, because it doesn't turn into water like ordinary ice. And as you can see there in the glove, as David warms up the glove inside, it's getting bigger and bigger inside. And if you left that lying around long enough, it'll actually burst the glove. So carbon dioxide is a very useful substance because it doesn't allow things to burn. That's why we use it inside in fire extinguishers. It's also very heavy, so that if you have a fire, it's the best type of fire extinguisher to have, because in the home, for example, because it works in all types of fires, 
But if you have a fire low down, the carbon dioxide forms a blanket over it. So it's a very useful uh, substance indeed uh, to have. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at some properties of another gas. If you remember a few slides ago, that one there, we said as well as carbon dioxide, we also have nitrogen gas. So when you breathe air in, 78% of the air is nitrogen gas. Now, what's nitrogen like? Well, it's invisible, you can't see it. But we can have nitrogen in the form of a liquid. Could I have another beaker, please? Now, inside here, Donica and Dennis, that's perfect. Thanks, Suderman, that's ideal. Now, watch this. What you're looking at there is you're looking at liquid nitrogen. Now, Dennis and Donica this afternoon went downstairs into our liquid nitrogen plant in the basement. And I'm going to put a bit of banana into that. Now, liquid nitrogen is a very cold substance. The temperature of that is almost minus 200 degrees centigrade. Liquid nitrogen is used in the food industry for freezing things like hamburgers. So the next time you have a hamburger, it could, for all you know, be 20 years old. S straight out of the liquid nitrogen. Because that's so cold that it doesn't allow things like bacteria to grow and cause the food to go off. We can also put into the liquid nitrogen this piece of rubber tubing. And we'll have a look later on and see what happens to the rubber tubing. Now notice that liquid nitrogen boils very quickly. As soon as it comes out of the thermos flask into the air, the temperature here in this room might be around 15 degrees centigrade. But the boiling point of that is about minus 200. So the minute it comes into the room, it vaporizes, turns into a gas. And even if I spilled some on the floor, Margaret, our cleaning lady, isn't going to give out to me because I'm not wetting the floor. The liquid nitrogen is going straight away up into the air. So there's no problem here. Now, uh, some of the students from Cove Community College said they'd help me. So we'll take the first student here. Could we have a round of applause for our first volunteer? <laughs> Great. Now, OK, so he's going to wear his safety glasses. Whenever you're using liquid nitrogen, you have to make sure you're wearing the safety glasses because it's so cold. If any of you to go, on, go on to become doctors or nurses, you'll be meeting liquid nitrogen. Because if you go into the doctor and you had a wart on your hand, for example, the doctor would put a few little dabs of liquid nitrogen and would freeze it so cold that you wouldn't feel anything when it was removed. Now, we're going to get you to hold that, OK? And now we're going to take an egg. Now, how many junior cert students do we have here, hands up, who are in first year, second year, or third year? <coughs> oh, we have quite a few of you. Great. So, now, in first year for your junior cert exam, you learn all about physical and chemical changes. And what we're going to do now is we're going to add liquid nitrogen. So turn around there so that they can all see. We're adding liquid nitrogen now to the frying pan. Just like that. Don't worry about your cold feet. You'll be fine when it warms up. OK, now... If somebody was to walk in the door there, what do you think that they might think when they see this man here with the frying pan and the steam, looks like steam coming out of it? What do they think he might be doing? Yeah, he could. He could be cooking an egg. Okay, but when you cook something, that's an example of a chemical reaction. If you fry an egg, you can't reverse it and get back the raw egg. And that's one of the things or characteristics of chemical reactions. They can't be reversed. Now, in this case, all we're doing is we're freezing the egg down to minus 200. And 
that egg, I'm just going to take that, if we just get rid of the liquid nitrogen, and we try to break the egg, it's absolutely rock hard, okay? So the, the egg inside there is minus, now, as you can see, I don't know how to cook because I wasn't even able to break the egg properly. But uh, nevertheless, anything I've ever produced has come out of a test tube. But anyway, this, as you can see, is desperately hard. You can't even break off bits of it. However, when that egg thaws out, if you wanted to, you could bring the egg home with you and eat it. So could, I suppose you could say that was an interesting egg experiment. Could you say that? <laughs> right. So a round of applause for it. Thank you. You can sit down now. Thank you very much. Now, OK. Now we're going to have a look. Right. Now, let's, let's have a look now at the banana that's left inside. We'll just add another bit of liquid nitrogen to it. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the banana out of the liquid nitrogen. Notice I wear gloves because it's so cold. So we just pour off the liquid nitrogen and we put the banana onto the chopping board. Okay. And now, you can see, so our soggy banana is now broken up. And that's how I make a banana split. <laughs> oh, right. Now, here's another inch. Oh, right. Now, notice rubber. Now, rubber is a very useful material. It's in our cars because it's flexible. When it goes over bumps, it absorbs some of the bump. But watch what happens when we cool the rubber down, okay, and we hit it. You can see we've changed the properties completely. It's almost like glass. It shatters into little pieces if I hit it very hard. So one of the things that scientists discovered so is that if you cool things down, you change their properties completely. It's as hard as a rock with properties like glass. So cooling things is a whole branch of chemistry, uh, studying properties at low temperature. <clears throat> there was an interesting experiment done many years ago by a famous French scientist called Jack Charles. And Jack Charles went up in a balloon over Paris. Now, we can't produce his balloon, but I'm going to show you the sort of thing that he observed. Now, if we go up, if I pour, before we talk about what he noticed when he went up in the balloon, supposing I take some liquid nitrogen here, and supposing I pour the liquid nitrogen, could I have another glove, please? Supposing I pour, thanks very much, the liquid nitrogen over this balloon. Could anybody try to predict what will happen to the balloon if I pour liquid nitrogen? What do you think will happen? It might explode. It could. <laughs> Absolutely. It could explode in my face. That's a good suggestion. Anybody has another suggestion? What do you think might happen? Hard. It could get hard. Exactly. It might get as hard as a rock. Great. Anybody else would like to make a suggestion? What might happen with it? It might. So we really don't know what's going to happen to the balloon. But the nice thing about science is we can test our hunches. A big word, hypothesis. So let's pour the liquid nitrogen onto the balloon and see what happens. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Now, now watch me blow up a balloon from the outside. Now, this is what Jack Charles noticed way back in 1823. What he noticed was that as the balloon went higher and higher, the balloon started to shrink. 
because the cold air caused, the cold uh, temperature of the air caused the air to contract and get smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is what happened inside in the balloon. The particles of air inside in the balloon contracted and got smaller and smaller and smaller. So he made up a law called Charles's Law, which said if you cool a gas, it gets smaller, and if you heat a gas, it'll get bigger. Okay, so this is Charles's Law. And now we come to the most exciting part of all the air, and that is oxygen in the air. Now, if you remember our pie chart earlier on, you can see oxygen is, consists of, the air consists of about 20% oxygen. So about one-fifth of the air is oxygen. Now, Donica and Dennis have very kindly here filled these gas jars with oxygen gas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to burn a metal called magnesium in the gas jars. And Donica, you might be kind of delighted that Bunsen, <coughs> excuse me, right, and, and there's the metal tongs. Now, magnesium metal is used in firework displays and it's also used in distress flares. So the light from given out from this will be a bit strong and you might find yourself momentarily blinded when the lights go off, but your vision will come back again very quickly. Okay? Grand. Right. We burn the magnesium into the oxygen. Right. Notice how brightly it burns inside in the pure oxygen. So generally speaking, things burn very well in oxygen. If you've observed carefully, if you look at the tongs there, there's a white powder around the surface of the tongs. And that white powder is a compound formed when magnesium reacts with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. And that's what they use to make milk of magnesia to cure stomach upsets. Now, there's another thing we're going to do now, and that is we're going to burn some phosphorus in oxygen. Now, phosphorus is an element that burns very easily. It's one of the elements in the periodic table of the elements that I showed you at the beginning of the Chemistry Magic Show. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some phosphorus powder in here. It's a reddish type of powder, and it's always stored in a tin because it catches on fire quite easily. So I'm going to just cover the tin there and put it out of my way, or else we'd have a, great, a fireworks display on right here on the desk, which wouldn't be very good for us. Now, okay, right, David, and just when I light this down, so we have the lights out, so, okay, grand, and we put this in here, right. Now, what you're seeing now, this experiment gave a new word to the English language. What appears as if there's smoke coming out is actually a white powder. And the new word that this gave to the English language was phosphorescence. And a chemical reaction, which is phosphorescing, is one that's giving out a lot of light. And even though all the lights are off here in the lecture theatre, you can see that there's great light. It's lighting up the, lecture, the entire lecture theatre. So the burning of phosphorus in oxygen is an example of a phosphorescent reaction. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to get our student from Cove Community College to make oxygen. And then we're going to try to trap the bubbles of oxygen inside here in the bottle. So could you put some of that in, just keep pouring and I'll tell you when to stop, into the inside of the bottle. <coughs> right, now the purpose, the purpose of this is to trap the bubbles of oxygen. Very good, you're doing a great job. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Fantastic, that's great. Now, sometimes in chemistry, 
we need to use chemicals to speed up reactions. Does anybody know the name of a chemical which is used to speed up a reaction? The girl in pink? A, a catalyst. Very good. You're a great girl. Now, pour that in there. Now, could we have a beaker, please? Now, this here is a chemical called hydrogen peroxide. You may have heard the expression peroxide blonde because this chemical is used to dye hair a blonde colour. Now, the chemical that you'd use, thanks Dave, the chemical that hairdressers you would use would be very more dilute than this. If you put this on your hair, you'd have none left. But we're going to ask our scholar here to add some hydrogen peroxide. Now, if you stand over here, so what I want you to do is I want you to pour this in, and if things get a small bit violent, stand back. Now, don't worry, because I'm right behind you, OK? <laughs> well, no, right, OK. Right, so pour into the bottle without knocking the bottle. Good lad. Yeah, just pour away now, and don't be frightened. That's grand. That's grand. Good lad. OK, now stand back now. Right, OK. Now, what we're doing now is we're making bubbles of oxygen inside in the bottle. <coughs> and the pressure of the oxygen coming out is forcing. OK, right. That's very good. Now, remember I said to you that the air consists of various gases. But what will happen if we take all those gases out of the air? What Donica has done here is he's taking some carbon dioxide dry ice and he's filling the bottle with carbon dioxide gas. He's then going to add a chemical called caustic soda to the bottle and he's going to shake the bottle to get rid of all the gas that's inside. Now, if the bottle is airtight and there's no gas inside, <coughs> perfect. Notice, the sides of the bottle collapse in. Now that experiment is designed to show that the pressure of the atmosphere exists and that it pushes in the sides of the bottle in order to make up for the gas that's, that, has been, uh, for, that has been removed inside. In other words, what has happened is Donica has made a vacuum inside in that bottle. And as a result, the sides have been pushed in. So that shows us that the atmosphere exerts a pressure, and it's this atmospheric pressure which causes the, the weather. Now, Donica, have you another trick up your sleeve? Can you show us what you're doing here? Now, this is something you can do at home, but do it over the sink, just in case. If you fill up a bottle completely with water to the top, and then put a piece of cardboard or a ping pong ball on it, it won't fall off. Now, what that tells us is that as well as pushing downwards, the atmosphere is also pushing upwards. So it's designed to show us that the atmosphere acts in both directions. Now, inside here, I have a very dangerous chemical. Before I came to teach at the university, I taught in a secondary school. And if I was teaching in the physics lab and anybody in the school stepped out of line, they would send the student up to me. I would connect the student to the 10,000 volt supply in the physics lab, and that would quieten them down very quickly. <laughs> and if I was teaching in the chemistry lab, I would do this experiment on the students. We have here a chemical which has interesting properties. Now, what hand do you use least? Left. Left, OK, grand. So we'll do the experiment on that just in case things go wrong, will we? OK, right. Now, what this chemical does, you notice that it's been kept in an old glass container. What it does is it's absorbed across the skin. 
it goes right through all the arteries and veins. Open up your fingers a little bit there, because the arteries and veins are that bit thinner in the fingers. And it draws out the blood. <laughs> the blood comes out of his hand. <laughs> and now we're going to take the student and we're going to come up here to test, has any blood come out? And again, and wow, look at that. But look at his hand. Absolutely perfect. You're a genius. How did you do that trick? Now, wash your hand there now. Now, of course, the story I told there was only a story. What I actually put on his hand was washing soda. What you'd have in redox bath salts. And that paper there contains a dye. Where's our piece of paper gone? Yeah, it's a paper called goldenrod paper. And that contains a dye. And when any substance like a base goes in touch with it, goes and comes in contact with it, it turns a different colour. You might remember the magic message that Dennis produced for us earlier on. What he sprayed on that was simply window cleaner, which is another example of a base, the opposite to an acid. And it sh because he had written on the piece of paper with an, a substance called phenylthaline, the phenylthaline turned pink. So when they're dyeing white paper, yellow colour, one of the colours in that is sensitive to bases. So even though it looks like red blood, and I bet I fooled lots of you with this trick, in fact, it's just ordinary indicator uh, paint inside. So well done, you, were, you did a great job there. Yesterday, we, I was talking to David, and I was saying to David, Look, David, we have some very important people coming to see our magic show on Friday night. Would you like to have a drink? Yeah. And he said... I'll have a glass of water. Yeah, that's water, because the lab, the Eureka labs across the way were very warm. So he poured out a glass of water. So what, what else did he say he'd like? A glass of milk. Good. I said, I love milk. This would be a glass of milk perfectly. And sure enough, he turned the water into milk, beautiful, full cream milk, mm, delicious, okay, <laughs> fantastic. But then I said, David, I'm not sure if that milk looks terribly good. What could, else could you turn it into? He said, let's see if we could turn it into beer. And he turned it into beer, and so he did, absolutely. And that's how beer is made, full of all these old nasty chemicals, and never touch the stuff at all. It's very bad for you. So well done, David. I remember when I was a little boy growing up in Cove, every year myself and my four brothers would be brought to see the fireworks display. And I also always found watching fireworks was unbelievably attractive. But we never explained how do all the various colours appear in the fireworks. And what we're going to do now is demonstrate that. What these students are going to do is they're going to blow some here. This is alcohol in which we've added various salts. And we're going to blow them across here, the, the flame. OK? Right. So here we have sodium, yeah? So the bright yellow colour of the sodium street lamp is what is, is caused by sodium. And the next person here is copper. OK, sorry. And copper gives a sort of greenish, bluish sort of a colour. OK, grand. And the next one here, that's strontium. Right, grand. That gives a nice red colour. So, OK, can we have the lights again, please? Right. So different, different coloured metals give rise to different colours in the fireworks display. In the front here, you might have seen these two little drinking ducks working away very hard all night. But they're not connected to batteries. There's no power going into them, but we can see that they've kept moving for hours and hours. Now, 
how they work is based on Charles's law that we explained earlier. How does it work? Here we have inside in the duct this liquid which has a very low boiling point. To get the experiment started, you wet the beak of the duck. And you might have been told when, it, when you were very young by your parents, don't put on a damp t-shirt because you'll get a chill. Because the heat will come from your body in order to evaporate the water in the damp t-shirt. What happens here is that the beak and the head of the duck are made of felt which absorbs water. When the water evaporates, the air inside here is cooled. It takes up a smaller volume from Charles's law, and the liquid here is pushed up to fill the empty space. And when the liquid goes up, the head of the duck dips into the water. The head of the duck is made wet again, and the, water, the liquid inside falls back in, causing the head of the duct to go back up, and so the whole cycle repeats. So as long as the head of the duct dips into the water, it'll be kept wet. And so it is an example of Charles's law in action there. The final part of our chemistry magic show consists of examples of explosions. Now, let me explain firstly what an explosion is. An explosion is a chemical reaction that happens very quickly. If it takes part in a, an enclosed space, the build-up of gases can cause things to move, to move around. Now, the first experiment here, and again, a volunteer from Cove Community College. Okay, I think you, were, you haven't been up yet, have you? You have? Okay, okay, the next guy, so you come up, so. Right, now, would, would you light this for me, please, Suderman? Thank you very much. What we're going to do here, and is there any uh, spoon, Dave? Yes. Please. Grand. Right. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to take a very dry, powdery material. That dry powdery material is called lycopodium. It's a bit like pollen dust. And we're going to put that inside here into the funnel. And we're going to ask this man just to hold the end of that tube there while I set it up. Now, have we got a lighting candle there? We have. Yes. Lovely. Now, what I'm going to ask this man to do is the following. This volunteer is going to take a deep breath and then we'll count them down and we're going to blow the lycopodium across the flame. Now could we have the lights out please? Right, so when, you, when we count you down to zero, all you're going to do is blow very hard into the tube. Is that okay? okay. Grand. So, Five, four, three, two, one, go. Ah, oh, yes. Right, very good. Excellent. Good man. Now stay with us because you're very good. Now, you'll notice there, there wasn't any explosion because even though it burned very quickly and you saw the flame shoot across, the gases that were formed have now disappeared. They're in the air, you can't even see them. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a similar reaction, but we're going to do it inside in a can. So this time, Am I doing the same thing yet? we're going to do the same thing. We don't need the lights out. We're going to put in a little nightlight. Okay, so Sudaman, you might light the nightlight there for me. Now, so I'm going to put in this lycopodium powder in there into the funnel.
Right, so we'll count down again. Five, four, three, two, one. Go, blow hard. Oh, yes. Very good. So there we had an explosion. You're a genius. This is an experiment that you could do at home with the permission of your parents. Now, let me explain what they're going to do. Grand, and a small beaker for putting in the water. Thanks, Steve. Grand. This is water, is it? That's water, yeah. Grand. Now, I'm going to give an Alka-Seltzer tablet to each student. So you come over here. There's your Alka-Seltzer tablet. Just put it in your hand, right? And we have another Alka-Seltzer tablet for you. Okay, grand. Now, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to put some water in each of these containers for each student. And then we're going to count them down. And each student is going to do the following. Each student is going to drop in the Alka-Seltzer tablet, is going to put on the lid very tightly. Now that's very important. And is then going to put it into a beaker like that. Five, four, three, two, one, go. In the Alka-Seltzer tablet, on the lid very tightly. Okay, upside down, upside down. Up. Oh, yeah, now if it leaks, unfortunately, it won't. Ah, oh, yes, that's very good going now. That's a great one. What happens there now is there, there's a build-up of pressure. The Alka-Seltzer tablet reacts with the water and you're getting carbon dioxide formed. Now, eh, oh, very good. That's, oh, yeah, nearly on Donica's head. Right. This is our second last experiment. And what we're doing here is we're putting in an alcohol called methanol. It's the alcohol that's found in methylated spirits. You might have heard of it. And we're putting this into this large empty container to turn it into a vapour. Now you have to swirl it for a long time because you have to fill up the container with the methanol. And what Sudeman is going to do is he's going to ignite the methanol. Now we'll just out the lights for this, okay? So you might light that there, uh, David, if you could. Grand. Right, Annika. Okay. And we ignite the vapour. Yes. That's it. Very nice. Very good. Right. Right. Now, I want you to listen very carefully because this is the last experiment and it is a bit dangerous. Now, explosions can be very dangerous. The lycopodium dust explosion, if it took place in a flour mill or a grain silo, it could knock an entire building, as you can see there. What I want to explain to you now is the principle behind the cannon. If we have a cannonball, and if there's an explosion takes place behind the cannonball, that pushes it out. What we are doing here is, Donica and Dennis have filled these empty bottles with a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, as long as the hydrogen and oxygen are inside in the bottle, nothing is happening. The bottle is just sitting there on the bench. However, if we supply extra energy, then the hydrogen and oxygen, when they slap against each other, can change into water. So this is an experiment to form water. However, when water is formed, a huge amount of energy is given out, mainly in the form of sound energy, but also in moving energy. So, when we ignite 
the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, so much energy is created that that bottle should go flying out into the audience. So if you see it heading towards you, duck. Okay. <laughs> now, listen to this carefully. This is going to be noisy. So, when I tell you, wait now until I tell you, I want you all to open your mouths and to block your ears. And there's a set of ear protectors here. Thanks very much. We have a set of ear protectors. Are you okay, Donica? Dennis, you better have them. Okay, grand. Grand. Okay, right. Okay, so Donica will ignite one. Grand. Right, okay, grand. Oh, very good. <laughs> right. No. Brian? Right. Very good. Excellent. And now, do you want to do the third one? That's right. Right. Thank, thank you all very much for coming. That's it all. Thank you very much. There we are. Great. Thanks.